Yes, thanks. I, um, I want to talk about strategies to um, actually not getting lost in transaction. And the thing I want to talk about today is basically this. Um, we want to do two things in a row, and we want to do it, we want to have all or nothing semantic. So I don't talk too much about consistency in, in, in kind of um, Cassandra way of dealing with data synchronization or Debezium or these kind of things. I want to focus actually on this kind of problem, which is hard enough actually to fit or to squeeze into 40 minutes. Um, I typically talk quite fast as well. Actually, James set a high barrier on, on, on a good benchmark on speaking fast, but I probably will also have a lot of content. We will probably run short in time. Um, I have my contact data on the slides later on. If you have any questions, ask me um, afterwards. Um, so if you look at that, once upon a time, that was pretty easy, actually. Then we just wrote, like, using a transaction manager. Um, depending on the language, it looked more or less a bit like this. We start a transaction, we do stuff, we commit it, or if we have a failure, we roll it back. If you're, again, depending on the technology, you might even have it a bit easier. Um, like this is, for example, in Java, you can say just add transactional, and then everything is transactional. That seems to be very easy. And that forms a so-called ACID transaction. ACID, it's, it's like basis here. Um, it stands for atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability. And that basically means when I do these like two or three things, it's atomic operation, all or nothing. That's what we want to have. It's consistent in a way that you can have invariants in the database, like um, relational in integrity constraints or non-null constraints or these kind of things. It's isolated. That's very important. So if you have two threads doing stuff at the same time, they don't see dirty data, depending on the, um, on the level of isolation we want to configure. And um, it should be durable. Um, that means, obviously, I mean, if it's a database, it should be there still later on. And the problem is now that we move more and more towards distributed systems. It's not new, but now we see it really emerging a lot with a um, either microservices, serverless, or whatever it is. So we distribute more and more. And I actually um, like this metaphor of distributed systems. Why? You probably already heard it in the last talk. You probably also know these fallacies of distributed um, computing. There's the, um, the network is reliable. That's a fallacy. It is obviously not reliable. Everybody using Wi-Fi knows that network is not reliable. And um, we have to take care of that. And this is um, why I love this picture. Um, the, the small hut is basically that's one service, one application. There we have asset transactions still. That's where, we, where it's nice and neat. Like, we have a heating. It's cool to be a developer within the hut. But whenever you open the door, there's the network, the rough ocean. And there are a lot of things will happen which, which will cause some harm. And we have to take care uh, about this specifics, actually. And now. If you talk about asset transactions and distributed systems for a long time, like for, for a decade or so, people are normally saying something like, oh, then you use distributed transactions. Because it's distributed, there is something like two-phase commit or even three-phase commit, XA transactions. You probably know that. Does anybody use XA transactions in production? Oh, one guy. OK. Uh, um, but there is a lot of literature about that, and I don't want to go into any details of that. It basically has a couple of things about the algorithm in order to make sure that something is consistent in the distributed system. Um, but it's like here, nobody, no, nobody uses that, and there's even um, like really great literature about that. If you, I'm, I'm a big Pat Helen fan. Pat Helen worked for Amazon at, at that time. Now he works for Salesforce. He's, he's quite a big. Um, guy in, uh, in the US for distributed systems. And he wrote an awesome paper. I think it was 2007 or something like that. Um, Life Beyond Distributed Transactions. Um, it's, it's awesome. It's good to read. It's a good read. So it's um, five or six pages. It's not, not too long. And my, my favorite quote is actually, grown ups don't use distributed transactions. And he explains that a bit. It basically, it doesn't scale. There are a lot of problems with that. So it's not a good idea to use um, these kind of distributed transactions. My personal favorite story about that is, a, is a, um, there's a Stack Overflow thread where somebody asked, OK, I have this application server. It can do two-phase commit. I enabled that. And now I get these warnings every time I start up. How do I get rid of the warnings? And then there's an answer. Um, oh, delete the files in this directory. The other guy answers, uh, oh, that worked. Awesome. The warnings are gone. Yeah, these are pending 
distributed transactions that couldn't be resolved because if, if somebody crashes in the middle, you have to resolve that yourself. Nobody ever understood these kind of things. So um, don't use distributed transactions. Um, another take on that, which I like very much because it's very visual to understand this, um, Gregor Hopi um, wrote an article about that. He's the guy who wrote the Enterprise Integration Patterns book. A lot of people know this book. And um, he wrote um, that Starbucks does not use two-phase commit. And he explains that with Starbucks that um, two-phase commit doesn't scale. So if you imagine like, a, like an old school bakery, at least in Germany, when you approach them and you say, I want to have like a coffee, then they get the money, then they make the coffee. And everybody queuing behind you waits for them to make the coffee until you're served, and then the next one. If you order like 10 coffees, the people will hate you because they want to just have a, like a short roll. And Starbucks, they just take the order, and then they have like a queuing mechanism, and then they have the baristas making the coffee, and then you have like a correlation idea, your name on the receipt, and you get the coffee at the very end. That scales much better. Um, that's a much better approach. So this basically means don't use these kind of distributed transactions. Um, Eric Brewer, I'm not sure if you know Eric Brewer, he's number, I don't know, two or four from Google, um, employee number two or four or something like that, at least one digit, I think. Um, he also wrote about the cup theorem, and already in 2000, so that's quite a while ago, this um, presentation there, um, he wrote that we have to forfeit C and I from asset, so that's what he meant, so from asset, in order to have available, performant, highly scalable um, applications. There's no way around. And he named the, the alternative um, basically available soft state eventual consistency that it forms base. That's what's kind of a marketing -ish thing. Um, but if you look at that, what it basically means is that um, if we have these two activities which we want to have in an all or nothing semantic, is that we split it up. We say we have two activities, like A and B, both might be atomic in its own, the small hut, transaction control for A and for B, but not an overall. So that means we're temporarily inconsistent. After I've done A, um, somebody else can already see that. So that violates the isolation of an asset transaction. And that's what we do all the time in distributed systems. We violate the isolation because others can already see what I've done before I really um, arrived at the end of the transaction. But, and that's the important point, we accept that because there actually is not a really good way around or it's too expensive or it's too hard to build. Um, we, we have to make sure that at the very end, um, we want to be um, consistent again. And that's what all these eventually consistency is about. At the very end, we make sure and we want to get consistent again. And that's actually not that unnatural. You probably know that from bank transfers. Before Stripe, uh, Stripe and before PayPal and these kind of things, normally a bank transfer, it still takes a day or a couple of days to move money from A to B. And that's inconsistent in the middle because the money is gone. It's nowhere. It's like with these all stage coaches. It's more or less the same thing. But the business transaction works. It doesn't, it doesn't require a technical asset transaction to work. You just have to make sure at the very end, the money is gone from the one account and it's on the second account. Everything else is kind, kind of okay. And if you have a failure, you have to clean up. Pat Helland also talked about that. He named it asset 2.0, uh, quite a marketing term. And he gave them the letters new meanings. And he said, OK, we, we have to make something which is associative, communitive, commutative, item potent, and distributed. The first two are pretty easy, like because we have these distributed systems. And if we have messages, for example, we cannot guarantee that they arrive in the same order like I sent them. So I have to make sure that doesn't matter. Right? Um, I don't talk about that too much today. I want to actually concentrate on the, on the next one and the very next one. Idempotency. Idempotency means I can call the same function twice and it doesn't harm. And that's actually, that's a super, super, super important thing. That's so important that I made my own slide on that. And I actually, um, I search for a good metaphor for item potency for, I think, for five years now. And that's the best I came up with. Um, if you have good ideas, I'm, I'm very happy. I can uh, I pay you a couple of beers in the evening if you have a good metaphor. That's 
perfectly fine. But my metaphor um, is a zucchini. Why a zucchini? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked. Um, I, I had a vegan um, time of my life, like uh, two or three months I, I ate only vegan, and there's an awesome vegan dish um, which is made out of zucchini. The zucchini is the pasta. So you don't eat pasta, but you make kind of noodles out of the zucchini, and then you add a sauce. That's, it's, it's really tasty. I totally recommend it. And there's a book, the cooking book I had, um, which basically says you can eat as much as zucchini as you want. You don't grow fat, it's not unhealthy, it's perfectly fine. Eat as much as you want, which is also great for a dish. And that means if you forgot, if you already ate your plate of zucchinis, you can just eat another one or another one. And that means zucchinis, eating zucchinis is either potent. <laughs> eating pasta is not. <laughs> and, thank you, yeah, that's, and that's really important. I mean, I, I hope you can remember that. Um, if you remember one thing, it could be probably the item potency, the pasta and the zucchini. Try the zucchini dish, I can send you a receipt. So item potency is very important. I make an example pretty soon. And obviously we have the distributed system, the metaphor we already introduced. And there's one thing I want to highlight with distributed system, which is really actually awful as a developer. One characteristic, so the network can fail. We have to accept that, no way around. But if the network failed, there's actually no way to really, as a client, whenever you make a request here as a client, you have no way to see if the request never reached the other party because of a network problem. If it reached the service provider, that probably blew up and didn't, get, uh, didn't produce a response. Or it probably has done everything, but the response got lost. That can happen with uh, HTTP, it can happen with messaging, request reply, it can happen with any technology. And you have no idea as a client what happened. And that's a pretty bad thing, actually. Um, so if you take a very easy example, and I will reiterate over that example with a couple of um, uh, slides later on. So let's assume you want to do payment. You have a payment service within the company, and that probably uses an upstream credit card service, something like Stripe or whatever. And now you want to do the payment, and you charge the credit card, and you have a network error. That's already pretty bad, by the way, right? Because then what do you do? The normal approach, actually, and we heard already um, things about service meshes or proxies today. So a normal approach would be retrying, which is a good idea, actually, because normally hiccups in the network might heal itself like a couple of seconds later. So you do the retrying. But at some point in time, ah, and this is why the credit card charging has to be item potent, which is actually easy to do, but always think about the zucchini. It's very important. So um, make sure you have something like, for example, transaction ID, because that makes it item potent. Otherwise, it's not. Um, so you retry. You have that. But let's say um, after a couple of retries, you give up, because you don't want to want to retry anymore. You have no idea if you charge the credit card. There are um, use cases where this doesn't matter. But especially this use case with the money, it probably matters. Your customer might be concerned about his money if you, if you basically say payment not successful. And that means you also have to make sure that it's not charged and probably call like, a, like another service where you say, okay, cancel the charge. If you never did it, it's also okay. But if you did it, cancel it. And this has community iterative. So if they overtake each other, you might even have a wrong um, ordering there. So that's quite of a challenging problem. But you have to think about that. And on top of that, we had customer scenarios where we did more or less things like this. Um, you, ha you basically cannot guarantee that credit card service is online at that time where you want to want to um, cancel the charge, where you, where you, for example, if you do REST request, you send a REST request to cancel the charge, but probably the service is not there. Um, and that's through my, um, it's, I'm, I'm probably a bit biased there, I come back to that in a second, but um, my experience is that for a lot of these kind of problems, you start to, to, to need state or state handling in order to do that. So for example, um, you do something I call that stateful retry. So if the credit card service is not there, you might not only retry it for in a second, but also in a minute or in 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And even if it's not important for the charging, it might be important for canceling the charge to make sure that this happens. 
I'm obviously, I'm, um, and the same thing for these um, other ACID 2.0 properties, like if you have out of order messages, that's by the way, the Enterprise Integration Patterns book from Craig or Hopi. Um, if you have out of order messages, um, there's a so called resequencer pat uh, pattern where you, where you wait for three messages and put them in the right order. That also needs state because you have to wait for them. And there might be a timeout where you say, I wait for 10 seconds, one minute, five minutes, 10 minutes. That depends on the context. So there are a lot of things where you need state. And this is the, um, the bias I have. So everybody is opinionated. My opinion, basically, or my background is I'm. Um, I haven't introduced myself, but I'm, I'm basically the workflow guy, I would say. So I'm working with the workflow engines for around 15 years. I contributed to a couple of open source engines. And um, with the company, we have an open source workflow engine, and we work for customers like, um, yeah, he said, Lufthansa, T-Mobile, Zalando, and so on. Also for the NASA, for example, or for the government of um, Catalonia, actually. So that's um, probably quite interesting. And Obviously, then I have a bias for um, the product I do. Um, but from there, what we do, and what we do very successfully also, is um, we use a lightweight workflow engine in order to, have these, to solve these kind of state problems. And I want to make an example, and I want to quickly show you at least some code, because I'm personally, I like to show a bit of like live code that you get an impression. Not to show the tool, actually. There are other open source frameworks which work more or less the same. So um, I have a slide later on that. But to give you an idea how that works, to, to really um, to get it from the slide to the code level. So let's say you have a payment. And the payment could do something like charge the credit card and um, do some stateful retry. This is a notation. I have a slide on that later on. It's called BPMN. Does anybody know BPMN? Oh, some of you. 10%, oh, I would say, which is not that bad, actually. It's an ISO standard for modeling these kind of workflows. Um, I, I hope the picture is more or less intuitive. And then you can do the same thing, like this is stateful, so um, this is saved in some kind of data store and can retry for hours uh, or days or weeks or whatever you want to have it. And then you can also do stuff like um, what I said earlier. If there are no retries left, I want to um, refund the thing, and again, this will be stateful, so you can retry it for ages, even if the service is not available. And let's quickly, I, five minutes, I want to quickly show you a bit of code um, in order to make that more, more, more concrete. So what I have, I use Java for the example. Who is programming in Java? Ooh, Go, Golang? I could switch to Golang. No, no, that doesn't help. Um, Node? Now I'm curious. Oh, a lot of Node people. OK. PHP? Ruby, Python, Jason. Oh, wow, Ruby. Ah, awesome, Ruby. Oh, sorry for that. I don't have, I, I, I could pull out a, no, no, not sorry for you. Sorry for the demo. <laughs> There's actually, I haven't talked about that, but there's, a, there's an awesome paper. It's called Acid Rain, Search for Acid Rain. Um, Adrian Coiler did a good blog post about the Acid Rain paper. And the guy who wrote that paper, he made a, um, a good um, study on um, Ruby on Rails, because Ruby on Rails doesn't use Acid transactions from the databases but does the transaction management on itself. And there, there are a couple of patterns which they didn't implement correctly. And they searched for sites using Ruby on Rails um, applications, and they could really break into a lot of things. So um, that's my story for Ruby. I'm not sure if that helps if you like me more or not. But um, <laughs> let's quickly do that. But I hope it's understandable. So this is the Java way of, or the Java Spring way of um, providing a REST API. Okay? And the REST API, what you normally do is um, you just post to the next upstream REST service. So this is the payment service, and it posts to the, pay, uh, to the credit card service. And then I add something like um, Hystrix. It's a circuit breaker. That's what you do if you don't use service messages. You do it yourself. That's the whole code. That's it. And what I can do is um, now I can send requests, right? So there it is. Um, ah, B2. Sorry. There we are. So we 
we did a payment. I actually have an upstream Stripe service, which I can um, make slow. And as soon as it's slow, I cannot charge it anymore because my circuit breaker times out, it doesn't work. So that's the situation I have. And the thing is, um, what I can do, and I show you the Java way, I, could, um, I can um, quickly comment on how it would work in Node or Ruby or other um, things. But in Java, it could be that I just define a workflow, and that could be I start here. The first thing I do is I want to call Stripe. There, I attach Java code which is the same code I just showed. I haven't changed it at all. I just attached it to the workflow. And then I can um, define retry logic in order to work there. And then I de deploy the flow, and as soon as I, sorry for that, I go very quickly. If you're not in the Java world, that probably is not that awesome for you. Um, oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong. I wanted to show the other one, actually. This is a bit easier. Um, and then if you charge the credit card, the only thing that is different now is you start the workflow and you don't call the post directly anymore. And now the behavior changes. So if I go to V4B, what I get is I get a pending 202. If you looked at it um, closely, it was a 200 before or a 500. Now it's 202. It's accepted. It switches to asynchronicity. And I still have like a workflow in the background. And I'll show you that actually as a, as a basis for, for stuff I want to explain in a minute. Um, and now you have that workflow engine running, so I can look into that where I see, OK, now I have like one instance still um, waiting there, trying to do the retry. If I look in the history, one probably already um, timed out and, and, and canceled the stripe and these kind of things. So the, the workflow engine does that in the background. If everything is normal, by the way, and I call the REST service again, I can get a 200 OK back. So it doesn't have to be asynchronous. But you have the option to have this state machine. And all you need is basically to define these, these kind of workflow, state, uh, uh, workflow model, which you just saw here. So that's pretty easy. That's the message here. Um, you can also define it graphically if you prefer. And to basically to connect to the Ruby world. What I just showed was the Java world, so I used Spring and um, Spring Boot in this case. Um, so there I had the engine directly embedded in my Java service. So that's why I just used Java code. If you're using um, Ruby, for example, or Node, you normally talk to the um, REST API of the engine. In, in case of Node, there's even a client library to use a client library to talk to the engine. Um, and this, by the way, that's not only true for Kamuna. There are other tools available, like Activity or JBPM, which do more or less the same thing. They are simple state machines. That's the important thing. So that's the basis. That's what we have. So going back to ACID, or ACID to the zero. Still, the question is, OK, now you did the retrying and the cleaning up. OK, cleaning up was kind of a consistent thing. But is that, is that what, you, what you want to say? Like, we have to just model these kind of things, retry and, uh, and cleaning up. No, that's, that's like one strategy. Um, if we dig, deep, dig deeper into that topic, there's actually an awesome book. I can totally recommend that. It's called um, Designing Data Intensive Applications from Martin Kleppmann. It was released this year, I think, beginning of this year. So it's pretty, pretty um, up to date. And he also gave an awesome talk. I can also recommend to watch that. It's on YouTube at the Strange Loop conference in 2015 uh, about consistency, basically. And um, he had this slide, which basically sums it up perfectly. So I used his slide before I just made my own. He said, without having cross-service transactions, so in my um, saying that would be without having these distributed X8 transactions, um, we only have actually two options to, to really to deal with that. So either we do compensating transactions, which I explain in a minute, or we do apologies. And let's get quickly over these two strategies because they are really interesting. Let's do apologies first because they are um, they're uh, much easier. So what it means is basically if you look back at the picture, so we have these two services. They are doing local asset. We are temporarily inconsistent. Um, but at the end, we either compensate or apologize. Apologize 
Um, again, um, Pat Helland coined that term. There's a good, good read about that. Memories, guesses, and apologies. He explains it with the, with the Amazon example of um, ordering goods. So if you order a book in Amazon, um, and they basically, it could happen that they promise to send it to you, but then it's not on stock because of inconsistencies. Somebody else um, just bought it or whatever. And then they just live with that. They don't try to avoid it up front, but they live with that. And afterwards, they apologize. Hey, sorry, we cannot send you that book. Yeah. Um, and that's pretty natural. I'm, we're all used to that. Um, that was my favorite example. I was actually sitting um, in New York in the hotel very late in the evening, just wanted to check in my flight on the next day home. And this is what I got. So that's the, um, that's the typical apologize. And they even do that by design. They like doing that, like they overbook. But that's the same thing. You accept this. And if something bad happens, you have to apologize. So that's the easy, um, easy strategy. The other one is um, compensation. And compensation is actually um, very interesting. Um, there, if you search for compensation, or um, it's also sometimes called the saga pattern, um, there's one classical example which is always used, um, which is actually not like the typical business example, but I, I use it as well because it makes it easy to compare things. Um, so, assume you want to book a trip. And that means um, you probably book a hotel first, then you book a car, like a rental car, or in my case it would be a train, but probably a rental car, and you book a flight, right? And then you get the trip. And these are like separate transactions. You cannot have like an XA transaction, it's even like different, um, um, different services in the internet, so there's definitely no distributed transaction. Um, and what happens if you cannot book the flight for, for some kind of error? You probably, it doesn't make sense to have the hotel and the car if you cannot fly there. Um, so you probably want to roll back that transaction, and that in this case means you have to compensate, and that means basically to undo, semantically undo what you already did, because you cannot roll it back. It, in this case, it means to cancel the car. It might, might cost money, like sometimes it costs money to cancel it, like a flight would cost money to cancel it, but that's the compensating action. It undoes what you did before, and that's basically the only choice you have there. And that's called the saga pattern. Very um, or Recently, there's quite some hype about the saga pattern, so it's good to also have the name in the back of your head. And if you look at implementing the saga pattern, that's, that's, that's an interesting part, actually. And Currently, I use the picture actually because for me it feels kind of a cat fight between um, basically two implementation approaches. So the first is called choreography and the second is called orchestration. It's not only actually true for um, sagas or distributed transactions, it's also true for microservice orchestration at all. The same fight is going on there. But I want to make the example to, to make it clear. So make Let's assume we want to want to implement that trip example, and we have these four services: the trip booking, the hotel booking, the car booking, and the flight booking. So the choreograph choreography approach would be okay. We have, like in this case, I make it event driven. That's even more hip. So that would be like the modern approach to it: event driven choreography. I said, okay, there was a trip requested, and the trip service says, oh, trip requested. That's my call. So I do something, and um, I say, okay. I basically um, probably even forward it, or the hotel service knows, oh, trip requested, that's also my call, because whenever somebody wants a trip, the hotel goes first, and then the hotel says, oh, I have the hotel booked, and this is um, published on the event bus, and probably car service says, oh, hotel booked, now it's my call, I, I, I book a car, and then the car is booked, and the flight says, and so on, so on, all right, oh, the car is booked, so I have to book the flight, um, and then the trip probably listens to the um, flight booked and says, oh, the trip is completed. Okay, so that is like the choreographed approach. The, the advantage of that is that you don't have a central component that probably some of the components don't know of each other and you, you um, can easily um, start listening on events. So there's kind of a flexibility in there. But in, especially in this example, it's very easy to spot where you have the problem. So as soon, for example, the flight um, cannot be booked, you have an error there. What you have to do is actually you have to go back the chain, so you have something like, oh, the flight has failed, and then the car service has to listen for that, rental service, and performs an undo, like 
the compensation. And then again, issues an event, and the hotel um, performs the undo, issues an event, and then the trip can say, okay, the trip is, is failed. This is a choreographed approach. Um, that was actually it. It's, it's really uh, one of the favorite approaches currently in, in the microservice communities, and I see a lot of companies doing that on a, on a big scale. And what they recognize is that they really lose track of what's happening there. And I personally was very happy when um, Martin Fowler, you probably know Martin Fowler, he wrote a couple of really famous blog posts and a couple of really good books, and he wrote in a blog post last year where he said, okay, if you do that, um, the danger is that it's very easy to make these nicely decoupled systems, but without realizing that you're losing sight of a larger scale flow and thus set yourself for, up for trouble in future years. So he also recognized that. And there are a couple of, so, so like visually it, it, it basically means it gets blurry. You don't see that process anymore, what's happening in, in, in the background. And there are other sources. If you search in the internet, that's currently quite a hype topic. So I also like the, the, um, the blog from um, Dennis. He basically wrote, okay, if your transaction involves two to four steps, that's probably still doable, but otherwise it gets rapidly confusing and difficult to track. Um, it adds cycling dependencies, so it actually makes life harder, not easier. Same thing, and that's also, I was pretty happy when um, Netflix started two or two and a half years ago with a project they called Conductor, where they have the same thing, and where they say, okay, traditionally, some of these processes had been orchestrated in a hot manner using a combination pops up, rest, whatever. However, as the number of microservices grow and the complexity increases, getting visibility into the workflow became difficult. So they also started doing something like this. And the most easy example to see why this hits the limit is as soon as you want to change the ordering. Let's say you, and normally these kind of transactions, um, in, if you do transactions in that way, you normally order the services in a, in a, um, by risk, basically. So in this case, or, or by cost, you could say, okay, canceling a hotel is normally um, for free, so I do that first. Canceling a car might involve some money, so I do it second. And canceling the flight is the most, uh, most expensive, I do it at the very last. And now you could be that you want to change the order for whatever reason, and that's pretty hard. In this case, if you want to change the order, you have to adjust all the services which is a really bad thing. And if you look at microservices, it means you have to redeploy them at the same time. That's the worst case scenario of microservices. So what's the, the alternative? It's orchestration. Um, you probably already guessed that this is my favorite approach, but I um, can, can add it for, for completion. Um, not for all cases, but in a lot of cases. So this looks a bit different. So if I have the trip request, it basically it commands other services, hey, book the hotel, hotel says, okay. Um, the trip says, okay, now book the car, car says, okay, um, now book the flight. So that's a bit easier to handle in this kind of situation. And now the trip service can uh, actually um, control that transaction, that business transaction. Um, if you want to change something, you have one place to do it. That's pretty, pretty neat, actually. Um, and this, again, could be um, controlled by this kind of workflow um, um, engine. So if you look at BPMN as a language, um, BPMN out of the box supports compensation. So these um, small rewind symbol, you probably know that from the old tapes, if you have a tape at home. No, probably not. Huh? Oh, somebody's nodding. Awesome. Somebody has still tape. No, that's a rewind symbol. And that means basically when I did the reserve car and that was completed, um, already, so if I advance here and if I have an error and um, if I want to trigger the compensation, then this compensating activity will be executed automatically. The engine takes care, even if you have like, you could have like so-called gateways to bypass the car reservation if it's not needed and you can have very complex models and the engine keeps track of what was done and what was not done, what needs to be compensated and in what order. And again, it's persistent, so even if the canceling car service is not available whenever you want to do it. It can wait for it. It can retry it. So this is the way and um, basically to get some kind of um, transactional guarantees. That's a compensation way of doing things. And that's basically implementing the Saga pattern with orchestration and BPMN. It's quite powerful to my experience, but again, I'm probably a bit opinionated there. Um, but so far, we make very, very, very good experiences with this kind of approach. 
And then um, one important thing is if, if I normally say workflow engine, a lot of people think of like, oh, this, oh, this is the BPM thing from the past, big vendors, um, like huge engines, like really complex stuff, hard to set up, hard to maintain, and this is actually not true anymore. There are a lot of frameworks out there, um, like the one I showed, which was very easy to do in code, for example. You can embed that in your service, so it's nothing you have to run central. And then the service really owns that compensation logic, the business transaction logic, without that you have to implement all the nuts and bolts yourself. And if you have other services, they might have their own compensation logic, right? Then you can also do it there. And that's very, actually very easy to track. And then you can still decide if you want to run like more multiple workflow engines within the services, which is what a lot of people do, or you can also run a central engine if you prefer that. So technically that's like a detail um, which you can still decide on. Okay, so that's the compensation part. If you search for um, sagas, um, there is a good talk from um, Katie McCaffrey. Um, at that time, she was at Twitter, working at Twitter, and she did a lot of work on the saga and um, saga pattern, and she wrote a pretty, pretty awesome paper on that. She did a couple of presentations. That's one of the best. Java on the beach, actually, and also in Spain. So um, you probably um, can look that up. And she has the same example. Everybody has the same trip booking example. And what she says basically is um, she um, recommends a so-called Saga um, execution coordinator to use. So that basically means even to, to extract that from the trip and to have like a separate component which is there for controlling these kind of um, transactions, just for that. It needs, it needs to be stateful, obviously. And it's, it's, I think it's understandable how it would look like. And the thing is, um, what, what she struggled with all the time, what they tried to build, um, at least uh, as a prototype, is something which is really um, resilient and scalable, because that easily turns into a, like a, um, a single point of failure. And um, that's what she wanted to avoid. And there's also a, there are interesting projects going on. One is um, MCB. It's also from us, it's an open source project. It's not a product, it's a, it's a research project, so it might be interesting to look at where we um, get exactly that horizontal scalability, resilience. We build on, on, on concepts like Cassandra or Kafka. Um, we're in the same um, order of magnitude of um, writing events like Kafka, so it's quite resilient and scalable, and that makes these kind of architectures possible. And I think it's a very... Um, powerful way of steering these kind of um, transactions um, because you also have like, like um, one area where you can look at. So where, how does my transaction work? Where is it stuck? Did it recover? And these kind of things. So there's, there's exactly um, one place to look at. Um, still, the model, like how I model that workflow must be owned by, in this case, like the trip service. So if you think of microservices, it would be the trip team caring about the model, but the SAC, um, how Katie names it, to execute it. it does, again, it doesn't have to be that way. It could also be like a workflow engine within the trip. That depends very much on what you want to do there. I want to actually emphasize on these graphical models. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of um, BPMN. I also wrote a book on BPMN, by the way. It's available in Spanish and English and German. Um, and I'm really a big fan of the standard. And I make one example, again, with the, with the same thing. So also Clemens, um, he works, still works at Microsoft. He wrote something also about the Saga pattern. He did the same example. Everybody does the same example, um, like car, hotel, and flight. And the thing is, in that blog post, and it is actually it's a really good example because that's what we see in every project. Normally, they implement that saga somehow. This is, the blog post goes on. So that's the code, how he implements it. But what he starts with is obviously the picture, because I want to understand the transaction. And therefore, I need the picture. I cannot walk through the code. The code is important. Um, but first, I need the picture. And this picture, it's drawn in whatever, probably, um, PowerPoint. So it will be out, out of date at the point when I look at it. So that's really a pity. And there's where, where BPMN is so powerful. So with these models I showed you, um, 
you can have that in sim. It's executable. It's directly executable. I, I defined it in code earlier on. You can also define it graphically. It actually doesn't matter. But what you see there as a model is directly executed. So that's also, Gyorgyo Archit talking about living documentation. That's basically what you get there. We, for example, we also generate test reports. Like, if I have test runs, I can see which path the current test executed. So I can really test these kind of things. You get a lot of, like, operations tooling, seeing where it's stuck, where it's flow through, and a lot of these kind of statistics. So that's actually pretty powerful. And only the orchestration way of doing it makes it easy to know where to look. If you have a choreographed approach, um, the normal thing would be to have something like, for example, el elastic reading all the events and trying to figure out the event afterwards or using stuff like Sipkin or all these kind of things, which is really hard sometimes to do. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of this orchestration approach. Um, OK, awesome. I think we got that. Um, last thing where I want to leave you with it is um, as soon as you, you probably like to go into, into the direction of that idea, OK, I don't, cannot do distributed transactions. But I have this property of all or nothing. So I probably need some kind of compensation mechanism. And yes, that needs states. Also, a state machine might be nice to have. Then you look at the workflow engine market. And this is my personal opinionated view on the workflow engine market. It's quite complicated. So we have a lot of players there. We have like the traditional BPMS parts. That's the easy part. Go away from that, go, go there. Um, then you have these homegrown frameworks, like, um, for example, um, from Uber, they did Cadence, Netflix did something um, with um, Conductor, Airbnb did Airflow, ING Deba in, in, in the Netherlands, they did Baker. So there are a lot of homegrown frameworks, which shows there is a need for that. And there are these open source frameworks, which I personally would, would, would have a look at. So for example, ours or also JBPM Activity, Mistral, I, I named a couple of them. There are also, if you're running in the cloud, there are a lot of cloud offerings popping up. AWS Step Functions, the most prominent, but all the others are catching up. Azure, Azure Durable Functions, IBS, IBM does something. Um, Google now um, does something with Google Cloud Compose, so there's a lot of things popping up. And even there, there are frameworks which are more focused on other stuff. Um, so it's really hard to, 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 um, to get an overview. If you look at that, what I typically recommend is to, to answer the, these four questions. From my perspective, these are the most important. So does it support stateful operations? You need state. I talked about that a bit. Does it support the necessary flow logic, like compensation? BPMN can do that, for example. Um, in ADAS WS step functions, you really have to work around with that work around that. That's pretty, pretty hard to do sometimes. Does it support the BIS DevOps? I call it BIS DevOps, that I have the visibility, the operations, these kind of things. And does it scale to the extent I need? VPMN is already half of, the, half of the way. And that's a standard. A lot of tools support that. Um, so I personally prefer to have a look at that. I can also give you my personally non-biased, completely objective pro list for a short list. So you probably also want to use that. So that's my personal thing. OK, so the very quick recap. So um, grown ups don't use distributed transactions. It doesn't work. It doesn't scale. You have to get used to eventual consistency. There's no way around. Item potency, the zucchini is super important. Yeah, don't forget the zucchini. Um, some communication challenges require state to handle. That's um, no way around it. And then you have these strategies like, for example, I just scratched the surface, straight for retry, the cleanup stuff, sagas or compensation or apologies. That's important to know. That's um, basically it. Um, I think we're quite on time, at least if the timer is right. There are a couple of links. Um, thank you very much for listening. I hope that was enjoyable. Um, if you have any questions, I'm still around here um, also for the evening. Approach me or ask me on Twitter, send me an email. Um, thank you very much. Um, what's your opinion on Google Spanner distributed transactions? Okay. Yeah, that's um, one of the things I spared. So, and um, there are just to, to explain the, to everybody, there's something called Google Spanner. What they do is they throw a lot of like complicated, expensive hardware to sync clocks between data centers in order to have like really, really asset transactions in a distributed fashion. Um, my personal opinion, currently, it's, it's, it's much too expensive, much too complicated, and only 
um, really useful for, for a couple of very, very narrow use cases where you really need that. Um, I have no idea if we reach that in like 15 years that this will be the new normal, but currently it's kind of a very niche thing. Okay. And um, also, do you have an opinion about Axon Framework, which is, I didn't know, a Java framework for CQRS yeah. and yes. Um, I have an opinion, but that would be probably an own talk. Um, to make it very, very short, um, I think Axon is interesting if you go in the invent source and CQRS direction, yeah. which is kind of a decision you have to take on an architecture level. If, that, um, if you do that and if you are Java, then Axon is interesting. Um, Axon also knows the um, concept of sagas. That's interesting. And we also have, for example, in, in a project we did um, hook in a workflow engine as the implementation for the saga, also in Axon. So that's kind of a combination which works quite well. So okay. that's my very short answer to that. There's at least one more question okay. on Twitter, but I'll let you answer it as On Slack or on Twitter? On Twitter. On Twitter, yeah, I will do. Awesome. Thank Thanks you. a lot.